Today, we're going to continue our discussion from last week. And as you remember, last week, we left off speaking about the Sermon on the Mount after discussing and we discussed the Beatitudes. And if I'll just uh, remind you that uh, uh, in that portion of the Bible, as I said last week, many of the teachings of Jesus Christ are contained. And those attitudes and expressions of a spiritual life that you could say Jesus asked of his followers. Now, obviously, <laughs> mostly of his disciples, because they're very high teachings, how devotee should live and the expectations in, uh, of that were very high. But nevertheless, we take one step toward perfection and eventually, eventually, eventually we get there. It's, but the emphasis on those teachings that we have, are discussing now, the emphasis is on loving God and foremost, uh, loving God foremost and then expressing that love through one in, uh, our behavior. So let's begin this week, begin with the short prayer, invoking the presence of the masters, invoking the presence of Jesus the Christ into our lives. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved, God, Great Masters, Blessed Jesus Christ, Blessed Masters, Blessed Guru, guide us, come into our lives that we might feel thy joy, and may we be thy instruments for sharing that joy with all home. And again, as I... Uh, I wanted to say that uh, uh, as we started this series of discussions six weeks ago, that uh, this will be the last class in this first section. Uh, I wanted in this in these first weeks, what I wanted, uh, my intention has been is to give a little bit of historical perspective to Christ's life to, to set the stage a little bit of what to introduce what was uh, his life about, a little history, and also to introduce, as I'm doing this week and last week, a little bit about his teachings. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and I'm going to be traveling to India. And when I come back and a little bit of rest, then we'll be starting to approach Easter time, and then we'll pick this up again, and we'll talk about another aspect of Jesus's life. You might say a little bit about the um, the mystical side. And of course, it culminates with uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, which is the essence to a large degree of what motivate or what really caused the Christian uh, religion and the life of Christ to come alive and to uh, tremendously give a great deal of power to the population at that time. So, uh, but now we'll finish up his teachings and you might say a little bit of that outward, that outward aspect. And uh, I was joking with Barakil a little bit before we came on the air and I was telling him we were going to talk about uh, and finish the Sermon on the Mount where many of Jesus's uh, famous sayings are contained there. And it reminded me of something that many years ago, I'd heard somebody was commenting about Shakespeare, and that the problem with Shakespeare, uh, that they didn't like Shakespeare so much, but his writings were so full of cliches. <laughs> and of course, that not realizing, of course, that the reason that they were full of cliches is he created the cliche, all those cliches in the English language with his writing. Everybody repeated him. And it's, it's a little bit like that when you read this, what we're going to be sharing today, the Sermon on the Mount, which was compiled, which was written by, you know, much after Jesus's passing by uh, Matthew. And I suspect, because there's, it's so jam-packed with these sayings, that I suspect he probably didn't literally say it in that order, although he probably said these things. I was suspecting that Matthew probably was making a compilation of what was being said because it took place. What actually took place was decades, uh, uh, decades and decades before. And so he probably compiled the basic essence of many of Jesus's uh, sayings or teachings in that one place. He did a good job of it, obviously, but that because they are so, they've been repeated so often, they've been incorporated to some degree in the English language. And of course, 
I, being brought up in the West, in a Western culture, these things are repeated all the time because of the religious background. But even out of a religious context, just in the language itself, I was using the example with Bar, uh, Barakil. I was saying like, uh, uh, I says it's probably somewhat people understand what is meant. We say, turn the other, if somebody offends you, turn the other cheek. I'm gonna turn the other cheek. Well, if you don't understand, where, why would, you know, I mean, it has some literal, you can understand what is being said there, but of course that comes from the Bible, but a lot of people might not know that, that uh, because, but it's cause, because it's an expression that's come into the English language tradition. And there's, there's dozens, scores, maybe hundreds of such sayings. And if you trace them back, they came from, they came from the New Testament and the Bible. And so we're going to go over a few of those today and just sort of elucidate on them a little bit. But I want to start by saying that, uh, again, reminding that what Jesus taught was new and it was fresh. And I think that alone was attractive to people. It was a new expression, as I said, a new expression, just as when Master came, he gave ancient teachings a new new clothing, a new expression. And I think that had, it, it awakened the teachings of yoga and Master's case, it awakened people to these, uh, these truths that were there already. And but that were perhaps overlooked had become cliche or people just dismissed them in in their older clothing so that in alone i suspect was one of the attractions of of christ when he was jesus when he was doing his ministry he was focusing on the spirit of the law and people probably felt constrained by just the letter of the law and so that was fresh and it was new and of course there was a very high bar but yet uh we need high bars to aspire to even though we don't always in our day-to-day -day life able to reach those high bars but i don't think it was jesus's teachings alone certainly not just his teachings alone which motivated people to take interest he had an inner power obviously somebody could have said those same words but they wouldn't have attracted people people were touched by his magnetism. It's not something they could see perhaps outwardly, but there was something inside of him, that power that was there. And his disciples especially were those who were in tune and those who were in tune with him, perhaps those disciples from past lives had and uh, uh, were ready, responded immediately. Like when he said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men to those first fishermen. Now, was it just that sentence that uh, had them drop everything? He, maybe in reality, he said a little bit more, but nevertheless, to make a sudden turn in one's life and turn away from a humdrum life of fishermen, he was a, probably a householder, just doing the things their fathers had done to turn away, because it was unusual. Obviously, they were devotees already because they were seeking and they had heard of the Messiah. It was part of the cultural tradition. And when people came and said, the Messiah has come, 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 they dropped what they had and they went and they took up a whole different life. And I, I can see that. I was, you know, I basically, I look at my life. I was a student moving along and, you know, what other people did and trying to figure out where my place was in that. And all of a sudden these teachings came across my horizon, up over the horizon. And I changed my direction entirely. And it was the same thing. You look at Swami Kriyananda, he's always saying, I took the first bus to Los Angeles. Now that's not usual for most people, but it's obviously a representation or an expression of somebody who was moved to change their life. And it takes power to do that. And, and, and it was not just for his close disciples, but we read that multitudes however many a multitude is, but you would think thousands of people. And particularly, so he had something, he had some power. And then I think though, what really started to move people is he began to demonstrate that power. And although we haven't gone into that in these classes, when we come back after our hiatus, I'll go into some of those. But have you ever noticed something in the autobiography of a yogi, uh, in the first page here, you know the you know the 
it says here, Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, and so on. It says there's this little caption here. It says, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And that's the human tendency. And of course, uh, that was demonstrated in Master's life. And I find it interesting that Master starts his autobiography with those words from the Bible. Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe it. And I have to admit, I remember reading the autobiography for the first time and encountering all those signs and wonders, those miracles and those things that defied uh, modern science. And I was a bit skeptical and I didn't necessarily believe them. But I suspended my disbelief and uh, in but in the back of my mind, I wondered, what if that's true? I don't know if it's true, but what if it is true? And I began to ponder my view of life or my what my my vision of what life was all about would take a radical change if those were really true. And I wanted them to be true on some level because I didn't particularly like the way I was seeing life. It seemed somewhat constrained and I, I thought there must be something more, but I thought, what if? And now, interestingly, this is what uh, Christ was also. He came with a, we, he came with a new expression. He came with fresh energy. He came, he attracted people and people felt that magnetism, but he also brought power. And that was the, the power to heal, miraculously he, healings to raise the dead, to turn wine, water into wine, all of these outward miracles that were not demonstrating. It was somewhat incidental. They would just happen. Things would happen in his presence. Things would happen. It wasn't any, you know, as any true master, he didn't say, I did this or I did that. God manifested that and God used him as an instrument for very miraculous things and people took notice and you can imagine if such a you know if such a person would step into the world today like that and of course this is what master is testifying to in his autobiography of yogi such things can happen and he attributed much of it to other people and other other uh other great saints but nevertheless through him and and through the testimony of master's disciples Things happened in his presence very casually that were unexplainable, but yet were miraculous. And so that was a part of, of Christ. And we haven't gone into that in these series of classes yet, but I'll come back to some of those stories and some of those incidents later on when we start to approach the culmination of Christ's life. But for now, let's let us today, let's go into the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount and, uh, it places, again, it coming about it, it, the teachings, you could say that, and the Sermon Mount only a fraction, but it does have a, it's a quick summary if you want to read. It, it is, it's a gist of much of what he said, but there are very much more than that. Uh, it, it's, there's an emphasis on acting. How do we act in light? A, and with purity of heart, not necessarily the rules, the Mosaic law, the Torah that had been passed down, but what's the essence in the sense of the spirit of those? And this is what he was elucidating when he was speaking to the multitudes. And it was new, totally new and totally uh, inspired in those at that time. And it touched people's hearts for those who could receive it. And it, but at the same time, we have to realize it was threatening because it wasn't following the rules. And I think we've all met people who are extremely rule bound and don't have an ability to see the spirit behind a rule. And, and when you break those rules, they get very upset. You know, it's just their nature. They like that fixity of structure. And uh, as, as so you can imagine, he was upsetting the, the natural or the accepted order of his day uh particularly to the to the priesthood to those who were in you know who were in control of the religious order and eventually of course it culminated in him being crucified and an easy way to solve the problem you might say from the priest's point of view but he was he was not 
going against ancient truth. He was speaking of it in a new way, and yet it wasn't about to be accepted. So you could say in a spiritual sense, he was a revolutionary. Many people clothe Jesus as being a revolutionary in a social sense. And of course, his words and his, his, his teachings had social implications as well. But he himself, you know, give on to Caesar that which is Caesar. And he was after people's hearts. But when people change in the heart, inevitably, social change takes place. And so you could, many people have claimed, and I suspect uh, uh, it's true, the implication of Christ's life and the effect that life had on history, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, was dramatic. And eventually it had to play it out, not in Jesus' lifetime, but in the centuries that followed, it ultimately did. It had a tremendous uh, a, a different way. Religion in its formality took on a different shape, but also people's attitudes and expectations began to change. change. It has had a dramatic effect. Uh, it basically, paganism of the Roman era, that sort of paganism, went by the boards. And of course, there were, as we understand from the teachings in self-realization, the earth was going through, our whole, the world was going through a dark age. And where it could have gone into it without Christianity, it could have taken a very, very different shape. But it planted the seeds of the spirit of Christianity. It's the good side of it. Uh, in the eth in the earth, you might say, as so that when going through the deepest part of the Kali Yuga, it was there. It was something to aspire to. Not that by any means was it lived up to, but yet it would be very different if those ages went through with something other than Christ. And eventually those qualities were embodied in the church structure and carried the Western world through the very dark, what are even called the dark ages. And so, but so these, if we go back to here, our topic today of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I'm going to read, I'd like to read some of these uh, stanzas, some of these uh, verses, and uh, just to give you a sense of it. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, how, where is, I mean, what's the essence of the salt if it's lost its favor? It is therefore good for nothing, but nothing, and not good for nothing but to be cast out. And I, it sounds a lot better if I were to read it in the King James Version, but I'm afraid to do that because the language is old, and I suspect many of you might not understand it, but it really goes, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then, thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, of course, what he's saying here, I mean, and, and then he continues on, Ye are the light of the world. Uh, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And here what he's saying in the, in the essence is that the humanity are the most important of all of God's creation. And he's just saying it, and he's saying, if salt loses its flavor, what good is it? And so in the same sense, if humanity does not let the natural light of God shine within them, they're not fulfilling their divine purpose of which creation was created for. Creation was meant for mankind. Now it's often said that man has dominion, as it was said, dominion over all the creatures, in the sense that creation has a purpose and it's for the awakening of consciousness in within mankind. And to the degree that we awaken, we let that light shine. And if we don't awaken, we are in a sense not fulfilling the purpose of creation. And of course, the consequences of that are rebirth again and again until ultimately we are like children of our father brought back to our true home in God. There is a purpose, in other words, and to the degree that we can fulfill that purpose of being one 
with the divine, we are then, you could say, following dharma. But to the degree that we're not, it's a dharma. And so he's reminding people that we are the salt of the earth. And he says, if thy light, if you cover that light up, you don't, you don't, uh, uh, you are the light of the world. And does somebody hide their light, hide their candle under a bushel? He, he says, no, you can't hide your light. He says, let it shine, because that's the intention, or as he says here, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that it gives light unto, unto all that are in the house. That's the purpose. So what is the purpose of our life? It's to shine. And if that light shines, not to hide it, is to let it shine and do good work, you could say. So it's being called upon, all of, all of us are being called upon, is to light that candle of light within ourselves so that the world itself is, is, is illuminated. And then we fulfill our, our divine promise. And then again, he says, think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come to I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill the law of the prophets. And we've talked about this before. And, uh, and, I'm, and so I need not go into that. And he says, you have then he one of his much of what his prof or his teachings were, was to reference back to the, the, uh, the Mosaic law uh, that was guiding the Jewish people. I've mentioned this before, and he came, and it's in, in these sermons that he gives a new interpretation to it. And Moses, it's often said, brought the Ten Commandments, and you could say that uh, Jesus Christ brought the New Commandments, how to interpret those in a new, uh, new way. And he says, you have heard that it is said by them of old, thou shalt not kill and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of, of being judged. He says, but I say that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother or insults his brother shall be in danger. But whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger also. So in other words, he's, he's, he's again, it's like the, uh, the, uh, Council of, Ni of Yama, uh, of uh, nonviolence, ahimsa. It's not just the action that is at fault, taking us into a violent action that is being prohibited, but the very thought, it originates in thought. It's more subtle than the outward action. So he's saying the same thing here, that we commit ignorant action, we commit sin just by the by the intention. So he's bringing here, don't look behind the surface of what's being asked of us to do and get to the root of it and purify on that level. And then we will be fulfilling uh, our true our true goals. Uh, he says, therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother hath has something against you, or you have something against you, leave your gift there on the altar and go your way. And the first thing is to be reconciled with your brother and then come back and offer your gift. So consequently, if we want to offer our life to God, if we offer our, our love and devotion to God, how can you do that if, in, if at the same time, you have ill feelings against other people, you have ill feelings against this person or that person. He says, first, reconcile your life, express your life, clear up misunderstandings, bring harmony to whatever situation it's, it, it's at that time that you can leave your gift on the altar. And when we speak of our gift on the altar, it's our love for God. You, to your, your gift is sullied. Love is sullied. If it's offered, well, in the back of your mind, you have ill will, discord with other people, or if you're living your life in that state of consciousness. And so here again, he's coming back. We have to first things first. Then he goes on, agree with your adversaries quickly. And then at least the time goes by and you are, and the adversary delivers you to the judge 
and the judge delivers you to the officer and you are cast into prison. No, I'm not saying it in the nice King James version, but that's the summary. He says, but make amends quickly with those. With, in other words, what he's saying, if you've done wrong, if you have karmic debt, you might say, in whatever way it is, don't just put it aside. He says, address it. Address if you see something amiss within it. Otherwise, who knows, you might be delivered to the judge. In other words, you might die, that karma continues, and then ultimately it's going to come back to haunt you. So why wait? Don't wait for tomorrow to uh, purify oneself. Do it right now. And ultimately, we want to do it moment by moment, not to carry negative karma, negative action, so that we have to pay for it at a later date. And he's basically saying, basically, that uh, the same truths that are based upon the law of karma that are taught in the Vedic tradition. So if you've done something wrong, make it right immediately, because the law of karma will catch up to you sooner or later. He have heard it said of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looketh on a woman to lust after them, has committed adultery already in their heart. In other words, it's not the action, it's the intention and the thoughts behind it. If thy right eye offend me, offend you, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Now, is he talking to people literally? No, but he was using an image. You know, if you're, it's, it's, uh, and it's not necessarily your eye that's at fault. <laughs> It's the thought, it's the doer behind that eye. It's just but of an instrument. Uh, uh, you have heard it said in the past, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the commandment of the Old Testament. But I, unto, I say unto you, resist not evil, but whoever shall do evil to you, turn thy cheek, turn it to the other, turn the cheek also. In other words, endure other people's misdeeds and respond with kindness and love to win over that person truly, not to just karma comes to you, anger, and you retaliate in the same way. No, put an end to the swing of that pendulum. He says, turn the other cheek, uh, resist not evil. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away your coat, let them have the other, and let them have your cloak also. You know, the other people's, in other words, be able to be strong enough in yourself with love and understanding, not, as, not from a position of passivity, but resisting own evil in the same an eye for an eye in that way. Win that other person over. You have heard it said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And of course, this is a very often, it's a, this is a commandment, you might say, of the New Testament of Jesus that is often repeated, love thine enemies rather than resisting evil. Now, this is not meant to be done passively. And they, of course, to be perfectly practiced, you almost have to be a saint to be able to be perfectly practiced that in the day to day life, day to day life. But it's not it's raising one's consciousness rather than simply reacting in the same consciousness of what life approaches us, approach it from a higher standard. And uh, uh, but if that's something to keep in mind, he says, well, why should I do that? The other person ends up winning the battle all the time. But keep in mind that it said that although God gives much to everybody, he gives most, or as it said, God gives as much to the wicked child as he does to the good child. It's just that the evil child cannot utilize the spiritual gifts given to them unless he changes his evil ways. That's a commentary by Master. And then Jesus goes on, For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Not even the publicans act uh, 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 do that. And if you or that's what the public, that's what the, uh, the normal worldly person would do. And if you salute your brethren only, 
What do you more than anybody else? That's what everybody does. He says, be therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. So he was asking us all devotees to rise to a higher level. Don't you just do the common thing, which everybody does as a devotee, the expectation for you is to, is to take, uh, take a higher standard. He says, uh, uh, and he says, then he says, take heed and don't give your alms uh, to just anybody. Otherwise, there's, uh, he says, don't cast your alms, don't cast your, your, your money before swine. Uh, what is that? How is that? Oh, no, oh, oh, wait a minute. No, that's a different, different one. It's, he says, uh, if you do give alms, but when you give alms, don't do it in a public showy way. Let not do it in secret. In other words, many, he's making a statement here that many people, they give alms, they do good deeds. They do it for public approval, for other people knowing what they're doing. And so oftentimes people make a show. Oh, I've given, I've given this, I've given that. And now's a photo opportunity <laughs> to, uh, to memorialize it. He says, no, don't do it that way. Do it in secret. Your, your God knows what we're doing it's in secret. Uh, and when you pray, don't pray publicly to make a show of it. That's like a hypocrite. He says, go into your closet and pray there. Stand in, rather than standing publicly in the synagogues or in the in the temples or on the streets making a show of it, uh, he said, "Don't do that." Verily I say unto you, they those sorts of people have the reward, and it's the reward implication here is the reward is not blessings; it's just merely feeding the ego, and. Uh, uh, he said, oh, hear this one. He says, be thou when thou prayest, enter into the closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to the father in secret that your father seeth in secret and you shall be rewarded appropriately. And again, don't make a show of it. And don't make a don't make vain repetitions as the heathens do. And they think that the louder they pray, the more effective <laughs> that they are. And it's in this part of the Sermon on the Mount where uh, Jesus offers a prayer that's often repeated in Christian churches. And he, he suggests to, that we pray as such, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. This is a common prayer known to any, anybody of the Christian faith will know and recognize that prayer. Uh, he says, if you forgive your trespassers, God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive your trespassers, those who insult you, those who do wrong against you, neither will your, your Father God in heaven forgive you, your trespasses. And so again, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And then uh, uh, he says, don't lay up your treasures uh, in this world. He says, for where your treasures are, there will your heart be. Uh, so in other words, this is a common saying that people say, lay not your, lay not your treasures onto earth, where moth and rat, rust doth corrupt them, but and where thieves can break in and steal them. So in other words, don't make your life reliant. Don't, don't seek a worldly outward uh, treasures because those pass, everything goes. Instead, lay your treasures up in heaven within your love for God. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Again, what does that mean? Thy whole body shall be light if it's single. This is, uh, of course, mystified Bible comment, uh, commentators for centuries, millennia. But of course, from the yogic perspective, we know if thine eye be single, 
Thy whole body shall be full of light. The spiritual eye, let it shine, make it shine, and the light will guide her way. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold uh, he will hold to one and despise the others. He cannot serve both God and mammon, or God and the world. And again, here he's laying down a very sharp line, because most people in their life say, well, I can serve God and I can serve the world too. Now, that's, of course, we're taught when we speak about that in a in a satsang is yes we can serve the world but it has to be not the world we're serving but we're serving god in the world we're serving others through we're serving god in others not putting our treasures uh, seen and seeking our treasures in the world itself so you have to be again seek the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, and all thy strength, and all the rest will be added unto you. That was his message. Then again, he, he, he says here, therefore I say to you, take no thought of for your life, what you shall eat, what you should drink, and, uh, not uh, what your body needs, what you shall put on, he says, is not life more than meat in the body and clothing? Well, that's a pretty radical teaching. Imagine he was speaking to people, don't think about these things. And the normal person was, how can I not think about those things? Of course, I have to think about these. Well, remember, he was speaking particularly here to his disciples. And uh, he was holding up a very high renunciate tradition. Now, it's very interesting how this tradition is is been very compromised in the West. Oh, you got to be practical. And that, of course, is the basis of much of uh, Christian practice. Well, let's be practical. Work too is important. Whereas in India and in the East, the idea of the wandering sadhu of actually putting that practice into actual day-to-day uh, -day life of not taking, not thinking about all these things and the wandering sadhu has actually been expressed and held up as an ideal in the East, less so in the West. So it's very interesting that way how the reversal here, Christ was a sannyasi in a really in the truest sense. He says, behold, the fowls in the air, in other words, the birds in the air, they, sow, they don't sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather their, their, uh, their harvest in barns. Let your heart, the, the heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye, are you not much better than they, the birds of the air? And so he's implying here, don't you think God is going to provide for you? He provides for the animals. He provides for the birds. You too, God will provide to you. Uh, why? And he says, why take thought of your raiment or your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these flowers. Where God so clothes the grass of the field, uh, which he, he takes care of the day and he takes care of the, uh, of the morrow, shall he not do at least that for you? That, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall, how shall we be clothed? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, of course, everybody has heard that, seek ye first the kingdom of the God. But it's prefaced by saying, don't worry about these outward things. God is going to take, take care of you. And if you put your trust in God first, somehow all of these other things take their proper place. And he goes on, judge not that ye not be judged. And why do you look and see the small moat or the little, the little piece of dust in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the beam or the boulder, you might even say, that is in your own eye. Uh, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, and 
Do not cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. In other words, don't, you know, desecrate the holiness of something, a teaching, and give it out to anybody who would desecrate it. In other words, speaking truth to people who mock you, people say seeking truth to people who are going to disabuse the truth that you share with them. It's better to hold your counsel and not for, uh, not approach people on that level. You could, Master used to say that if if a good person tries to convert an evil person and they're of the same magnetism, the evil person will end up converting the good person to their ways. You have to be much stronger than somebody of evil temperament to be able to convert them and to be able to bring them over to a righteous direction. He says, so such people, when you encounter high negativity, don't share deep truths with them. Don't, you know, in other words, don't cast your pearls before them. You have to take an approach that's going to be more practical with them. But for those people who are willing to hear what you have to say, then share it, share it with them. Don't hide your light under the bushel, share with them. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Again, a very practical teaching, but we have to remember, we have to seek, we have to knock on that door. And until we do so, the door won't open. So the, the burden of obtaining spiritual blessings is on us in the sense that we have to hold our, our glass up to the water that it might be filled. It's not going to come without our receptivity. So the first step of our spiritual journey is to be respect, receptive and open ourselves and ask for blessings. Seek God. God is very patient, it said. God waits. Divine Mother waits. And then when the time is right, and the right time being that when we are actually open and receptive and wanting spiritual truth, then God supplies it. And he says here, of, of, of what man is there whom if the son should ask for bread, will the father give him a stone? In other words here, if you've appealed to the divine father, ask in expectation that God will give you that which you need. God is not going to return. If you ask for bread, God won't give you a stone. He'll give you that which you need. But we have to ask in loving, you know, in a loving appeal and openness and ability to recede. Uh, or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? And then he says here, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate uh, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to the destruction. In other words, the straight gate means a narrow. So another way of saying narrow, that's the spiritual path has a narrow gate that we need. But the worldly path, the path to entanglement, the path, path to worldliness is a wide gate. And you could see you could take that into an inner meeting of the, the inner gate of entering into the inner kingdom of the inner spine. That's a narrow gate. In other words, there's there's many temptations to go left, right, and hither and hither and yon, but the the pathway back to God is much more of a narrowed focus gate. And temptation is everywhere, you might say, and by the way of looking at that. So there's a lot of ways to miss. But if we put our mind upon God success is sure. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Well, we've heard that all, but beware of false prophets. Many people, uh, I don't think that needs explanation. And But then he gives here, he gives a bit of counsel. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes? of thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No, and this is something you shall know them by, the, by their fruits. And I think this applies to any teachings. You know the truth of the teachings by the fruit that it bears. And sometimes you see somebody and you don't know, is this, you know, what's, you know, is this person 
for real or they do they have good intentions you're not quite sure judged by their fruits and this is something swami used to always say to us and people or a new person would come to him and says i don't know which way to go should i go this way this spiritual path that spiritual path what is right for me and swami would tell them he says go where you feel joy and again this is a, a universal truth he says, wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Uh, but not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. In other words, again, you'll know people by their fruits. They may be very pious, outwardly sounding, but they don't do dharmic action. Again, you'll know them by that. Uh, Well, anyway, it's, it's getting late. But then he, can, he goes on many of these. There's dozens and dozens. And at the end, he says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these saints, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as did the scribes. In other words, people could feel, you know, somebody who's speaking truth, you just know it. They speak with authority. In other words, they speak for, from what they have experienced. And I think this is important for us, too, is we can say many things. We don't want to just be piously repeating doctrine. Or I could read, you know, reading something from the Bible. These are good things to read, good things to study. But we also have to speak from our own inner experience. And ultimately, and I think the, the Gospels of Christ, Gospels of Jesus emphasize this, we have to speak from our experience and we have to speak from our actions. Our actions, you could say, speak for themselves of what our life philosophy is. We can say many things, but that's what really is going to be heard by other people. When we look back on a person's life, it's what did they do, not what they said. What was their life all about? And I think this is what we take for ourselves in introspection. And so these, these parables, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, they're just a, you could say they're a framework uh, for Jesus's teachings. And uh, they're with a foundation, you might say, uh, uh, for the establishment of a holy life. Just as you would say that in the old days, the Ten Commandments were in a, a foundation upon which the Jewish people would build their, uh, build their life. And the same way we would take the Yamas and the Niyamas and the, the, uh, the laws of Manu. The, we take these as a foundation, but they're the foundation of which we have to build something more. Uh, and as I, I'll conclude with this reading from the Bible, and Jesus said, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. This is what Jesus said. God it is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And of course, as opposed to in just following the letter of the law and what other people have said, worship him in spirit in tr and in truth. And how do we come to that? It's through our own inner, inward exploration of what the words of Jesus meant and through our inward techniques and practices and in our case, in our age, in our new expression that Master brought to us, by doing that what has been handed to us, practicing our meditation, practicing our own technique, doing the various other exercises that have been given to us, and ultimately practicing Kriya, and then experiencing firsthand the spirit of, uh, that is behind the outward form of the outward teachings. So let's let's now take a break from our weekly classes. Uh, for some of you, I'll see you in India, I hope. 
and you can we're going to be doing different programs we're going to be doing a program in Ludhiana uh, Coimbatore and also we'll be doing one in Pune and perhaps you can tune into those as well online and just contact uh, Barakil and the online ministry and they'll be able to give you all the data and details for that and then when I come back give me a few weeks to rest and then we'll pick up the discussion again and go into that you might say a little bit more mystical uh, side of what Jesus's life and exp kind of explain a little bit about those incidents as well. So God bless all of you, and I hope to see you soon, perhaps some in person. If not, we'll see you back here online on Monday evenings. God bless all of you.